Uh, hello guys. Uh, we are at the third segment of the uh, show line. Uh, in the previous segment, I stopped at the process that shaped the course. So we're going to start right here. And the first thing we have to talk about is the coastal erosion. Probably one of the most important source for coastal erosion are the waves. Uh, and in this case, the erosion is caused by the backwash and the, the swash. You know, the swash is where the water goes up, the backwash when it comes back to the ocean. Uh, you must know that the waves has very big energy. Uh, and I have it right here that it could be like just in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, when we have um, like storms, the the pressure of the Atlantic waves can be 10,000 kilogram per uh, square meter, which would be like if 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 a 1,000 ton weight steel, like a boat or something, could be moved just uh, during during a ro normal regular storm in the Atlantic Ocean. The wave erosion is much bigger along shorelines where the sediment is unconsolidated. Uh, and of course, it also depends on the orientation of the of the of the shoreline because depend on if it's in the direction of the prevailing wind, you will see more erosion. Or if it's like on the other side of the bay, then you're gonna see less erosion. So it's very important the 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 situation of the coastline relative to the prevailing wind. And this just shows you that. Most of the time, the waves are going to be concentrated at the headlands, and you will see that position in the bay area right here. So that's the bay area, and you have extreme erosion on, at the headlands, like when you have rocky shoreline. And you will be able to see stuff like that. So if you are in that kind of situation, it's almost silly to build a house right next to the, not next to the shoreline. And I've seen a lot of it, like in Oregon. People are building houses right on the edge, and it's silly because that is an eroding shoreline, and the and the the rocks are going to be eroded more than the bay area because that's where you don't have erosion, you have sedimentation there. So do not do that. It's not such a good idea. There is another one just for you. Look at it. I mean, and some of these houses might be like a million dollar house. The next thing we have to talk about is the landforms, which are produced by coastal erosion. Um, the first one is the sea caves. I want you to remember. So the sea cave is when the wave hits, basically it's wave abrasion. And the abrasion happening, and as it's happening through time, uh, it will end up in like formation of caves. But don't forget, this is very different cave from the normal limestone cave we went at Dixie Cavern. This is like along the shoreline and it's caused strictly by the abrasion of the waves. Sometimes these are amazing caves, like in Oregon there is a bunch of them. And then of course in the Mediterranean there is a bunch of them. The waves are very, very active and very high pressure on the Mediterranean Sea also, just like the, the Oregon or Washington coast. Now, sometimes after a while, the caves are going to collapse and you will be ending up with a sea arch, just right there. That's the sea arch. So, sea cave, sea arch. There's some other beautiful sea arch. And I know it's in Iceland because of the basalt. The basalt is uh, in Iceland is black, so you can kind of tell them apart from anything else. When the, when the sea arch collapses, you're going to end up with a piece of rock, which is... Uh, you know, outside of the land area, so you have no idea that they used to be connected, but in every case, they were connected. So this is the so-called sea stack, sea stack. And there is another amazing sea stack in Iceland, and you can see the columnar basalt join, so it's very, very characteristic for Iceland. Um, now let's talk about coastal transport and deposition. Uh, when when there is excess sediment on the on the shoreline, then a so-called beach will form from the excess sediment. Uh, so most of the time, this is what will form the beach. It is de defined as the dynamic, relatively narrow segment of the of the coastline, and it washed by the waves and the tides right here. It may co contain sand, silt, even gravel, depending on, 
what is the width of this area depend on what is the energy of the waves the higher the wave energy the bigger the grain size which is going to deposit there uh, if the wave energy is not that big then you will have sand and silt and when you have sand and silt together that actually makes the the shoreline really kind of hard so you can even drive on it if the sand grain size is exactly the same it will behave like quicksand and you cannot even really easily walk on it this is quicksand and when you have like bigger grains and you have the small grains in between that kind of fills it up and that's what makes kind of a hard walking surface when you walk on the beach versus when it's all the exact same grains and they all are very well rounded that's the quicksand right here and this is so this is Miami it's really hard to walk in Miami or not just uh, Miami but also uh, Atlantic City Atlantic City uh, and this is rather like Georgia North Carolina Daytona Beach where you can drive on the beach just like here uh, when when you have sand on the beach you very very frequently will see dune fields like toward the land and um, that is forming by the wind blowing sediment uh, onto the onto the dry land area and there you will see cross bedding the sand is usually um, making up big dune fields and it can be moved anytime there is a storm sometimes you will see in higher elevation actually the sand dunes are going to be um, covered up with vegetation if if it could happen and then behind that you're going to see like swampy areas like in Virginia Beach you have that so here are the boundaries of the beach uh, the low tide line to the sand dune fields or where the permanent vegetation starts uh, that is the the beach basically and this is the parts of the beach we have the foreshore which is the low to high tide line the back shore which is the high tide line to the sea cliff or vegetation line and the beach face is the steepest part of the beach and on the next slide I have this all uh, sorry all on a, on a figure I will not ask you to draw this figure so you don't have to worry about it but remember these zones the foreshore backshore beach face and and so on okay the next thing we have to talk about is the sediment which is forming by the longshore uh, drift and uh, basically the long longshore current not only uh, carries the water but also the sediment in it remember the longshore currents with is equal with the surf zone and that is the area where the sand actually will travel and uh, as the, of course this cannot turn so if you have a bay area you're gonna end up with a so-called spit like the sediment is just traveling straight even though there is a bay in there so it actually will start closing the bay area from the open ocean right here and that is what's gonna be a lagoon right there forming but at the next one where you have the so-called bay mouth part and when you play this slideshow it actually will um, it's animated so it will move you're gonna have um, this completely closing the the ocean from this bay area now there is a picture right here see this this longshore current put this bay mouth bar right here and the bay behind it is completely closed off now there are two cases if it's a humid area then this area is going to be full of trees and vegetation so this is going to be perfect for coal formation now if it's an arid area there is no plants there, there are no plants so that's a great place for evaporation and salt formation so these are very important geological resources on the long term yes it is a beautiful beautiful bay mouth bar and there is a spit right here so you can see it right here too and the third form you have to know is the tombolo the tombolo is like when you have like a sea stack out in the ocean and the sand will actually connect that sea stack with the with the land it is very rare form but we call it tombolo and now we are at the at the place where we have to talk about human induced 
coastal deposition. And this happens when, when people are building walls, sea walls, which, which produces deposition, uh, which induced by humans. And uh, this is what we're going to learn about. So the first one is the breakwater. The breakwater is like if this here is the, the shoreline, here is the land. And somebody decides to build a new marina because, you know, all the boats need no wake zone. So they will put a seawall like this next to the coast. And then you got the marina, no wave zone. And the boats are going to be right here. However, if this is the longshore current here, like it's bringing the sediment right here, but because uh, there is the seawall, the sediment is going to be all deposited right here. And um, so it's able to settle down right here. But when it gets beyond the, the marina, then it's going to erode. So if you happen to have a house there, it is an easy, easy thing to see that there is erosion. Okay, so that is the, the breakwater. And I have a picture here of a breakwater. So it's a pretty serious seawall. The next one is the jetties. No, sorry, the groins. The groins are actually uh, seawalls. Uh, built around areas where there is intensive beach erosion and people need sand. So what happens here is your land and of course the beach. And what they do to increase the amount of sand, they put these so-called groins, which are like sea walls. They made like this. And this will actually, if the longshore current is going this way, it will build up sand right here it's gonna be less and less but still so this is the the groins now of course you will have major erosion right here so erosion is here and building up sediment is right here uh, and this is just another drawing of the groin you can see how much sediment it ca ca uh, catches and you have major erosion behind it and this here you can really see them, but look what happens with this. It seems like it's a factory. See, it, the beach right there is really eroding, where it really builds wide here and here, but it's eroding right here. And the third one is the jetty. The jetties are built to prevent deposition in, in okay. channels where, where um, boats are coming in, so right here. Uh, originally, this was the end, but because of the longshore current, of course, it's going this way. So you have deposit here. And if there was no jetty, it would be depositing, depositing all the way through. And then the boats cannot come in because it needs deep water. So they build these rock walls. So they make the channel longer. So the water stays deep for the boats to come in. And that will produce deposit here and major erosion right there. So... That is the, the jetty. Uh, and now we are at the beach nourishment. That's usually a not very good practice either because whenever you have a highly erosive beach, uh, a lot of the times people try to put more sand by bringing it from somewhere else. And when that happens, if unless they do the exact same grain size, uh, as soon as they put the sediment down there, it's going to take it right away. One of the worst examples was around Miami. Here is Florida. This is Florida Bay. Here are the, uh, I mean, this whole area. Here are the Keys. So this whole area is Florida Bay. Uh, so what happens, they put down the sealed sediment from Everglades right around Miami. This is Miami. And what happened, the sealed size sediment went over exactly to the coral reefs and basically killed all the coral. So as soon as they put that sealed sediment down in Miami, the longshore current started to take it away because it's an erosive beach, so it just won't stay there. So it's very important that before you do stuff like that, you have to really think about what's going to happen. So that was beach nourishment. 
So now the next thing we have to talk about is the types of costs. We have two kinds of primary and the secondary. Primary costs are the costs which formed by non-marine processes, uh, such as the, the glacial erosion, like fjords, and you can find a lot of that in Maine and uh, very, very North Canada. And you can also find it like around Iceland and in the Northern Atlantic, of course. If you have stream deposition, that also counts as primary cost, which we have at the Gulf of Mexico, of course. And then even the coral reefs count as primary cost because they are not formed by marine processes, obviously. Uh, on the other hand, the secondary cost is the type of cost which formed by marine processes. So this was the primary cost. And on the long term, uh, because of the headland area is eroding and there is sedimentation in the, in the bay area, on the long term, the beach is becoming straight. And that is the secondary cause because it produced by marine processes. So that's that. And uh, now we have to think about vertical. Like we can have the emergent cost. Emergent cost is when the, the sea level is going down relatively the coastline. It can happen in two ways. One is when the sea level is actually really going up. No, sorry, sorry, the other way. When the sea level is going down because we're talking about emergent cost. So one way is when the sea level is actually going down. And the other way is when you have an uplift, which plate tectonically means that the whole area, let's say it's an oceanic continent or plate boundary, and the whole area is going up and it's going up faster than the sea level increasing. That's what happening today if you go to Oregon, Washington, those states have like the uplift actually is faster than the sea level rise. So therefore, these guys are emergent costs. You have, um, when you have an emergent cost, you have wave cut terraces as the, as the land is increasing relative to the sea level and you have beach cliffs. It's very, very common. On the other hand, if you have submergent coast, you have to think of the eastern coast. That is when, when the sea level is rising relative to the land. So therefore, you got more and more uh, land area covered with ocean. In this coast, you got um, estuaries as the river is trying to come in it will produce estuary, which means estuary is an area where the fresh water is mixing with the seawater. We call it brackish water. And um, it produces a lot of drowned uh, river valleys. And those are, as I just told you, the estuaries, like the Chesapeake Bay is typical for that. And in the estuaries, you have the best shrimping areas. However, if I were you, I would definitely do not want to eat any fish food from the Chesapeake Bay. This is the most polluted area in the US, so don't do it. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this chapter and I will see you. Thank you, bye.